Hi there, Mr. Chris here. So a lot of forces impact your lives each day. You are influenced by your parents, by your church, by your school, by your friends, by the content you consume on the tube of you, TikTok, Netflix, by the things people post on social media, etc. Two of the bigger influences on your life are the government systems under which you live your lives and the economic systems under which you work, buy, and sell. These modern forms, uh, or the modern forms of these two influences have slowly developed in what we know today over the last 500 years or so. Modern style governments arose out of European countries fighting each other in the late medi medieval and early modern times. And as war became more costly, the countries had to develop more organized forms of government to collect taxes, and the more taxes that were collected, the more complex the armies and governments could become. Now, the modern style economy we know today arose out of the age of exploration in the late medieval and early modern age, in which European corporations and governments organized fleets of ships to sail all over the world to find gold, silver, spices, and other goods, sadly, that would include slaves. Now, these two forces, the government and the economy, have interacted in various ways over the last 500 years. Each country has its own story to tell about its government and its economy, and I'm going to give you just one quick example here. The King of France and the French nobility reached the height of their power around the year 1700. The French King Louis XVI ruled with absolute power. He controlled the economy, he controlled the military, he controlled whatever he bloody well wanted to control. His power was absolute. He was called the Sun King because his power and glory were so Right. However, the French nation revolted against this absolute power of the French king during the French Revolution. Starting in 1789, the French eventually removed King Louis XVI, which is the great, great, great grandson of the Sun King, from power. They chopped off his head, then chopped off the head of his queen for good measure. Although the French were all about freeing the lower classes, they never freed up the economy. Instead, their economy remained highly regulated and controlled, a command economy. The French were much more more concerned with civil freedom um, than economic freedom. So they freed slaves, but didn't really free the economy, for example. The revolution ultimately failed to establish a democracy for the French. A young general named Napoleon Bonaparte seized power around 1800 and held onto that power more or less for 15 years. He was a dictator. After Napoleon, the French put another king on the throne, but from that point on, the French began moving toward a much more modern understanding of government and the economy. The king's power was never absolute again. It was limited. Along with that, the economy became less regulated in France. Today, France operates as a free nation that holds regular political elections. Its economy is far more socialistic than the United States. However, the economy is still considered a relatively free economy. So you can still get your baguettes relatively free. Like I said before, each country has its own story. However, the typical trend has been for European countries to start with a really strong central power, like a king, that controls everything, including the economy. This strong central power eventually loses power to the people, and during this time, the economy becomes much more free, relatively, and then as the countries industrialize, governments grow in power to keep peace between large businesses, business owners, and their workers, and to ensure that a populace that largely lives in cities, because they're working the factories are kept safe. This sets up conflict between governments who focus more on cities and people who live in the country who feel the government is overreaching. This stage is where we specifically find ourselves here in Oregon and Lynn County at this very moment. So for example, the policies that are coming from Washington, D.C., and from Salem, Oregon, concerning coronavirus makes more make more sense in cities. However, here in the country, we struggle to understand why the government wants us to be so cautious. This sort of misunderstanding is typical in the highly industrialized era in which we find ourselves today. The point of this little history lesson is to show that modern Western governments have tended to move from a policy of relative economic freedom to a policy that looks relatively closer to, social, to something like socialism. Socialism is an economic system based upon collective ownership and control of nat national resources. Our lesson today deals with the mistakes that governments in the past have made as they clamp down on a free economy. Hopefully, the U.S., Oregon, and Lynn County will not make these same mistakes. 
First, excessive taxation. It's not hard to understand how burdensome taxes can eventually kill an economy. The more citizens are taxed, the less the amount of money they have to spend and save. Take a look at your paycheck stub. Do you see how much money is going to the federal government? Do you see how much is, is being taken out to fund Social Security? Do you see how much is being taken out taken out to fund the state government and then ask your dad how big your county property tax bill is. All of these taxes diminish the amount of money your family gets to keep or you get to keep and spend or save. Federal tax dollars are primarily spent in two places. First, defense, and second, social programs. What are the two basic things the federal government is supposed to do according to the Constitution? They are supposed to, one, keep us safe, and two, make sure the economy works. It makes sense, then, that we all chip in to pay for those two things. It all, um, so, you know, we pay for security, we pay for, you know, agencies that are in place to make the economy work. How Ever a lot of money is spent on social programs to rural people who primarily farm, such as most of us living here in Lynn County, um, social programs that provide income, groceries, and housing to low-income people tend to be hard to understand. The question that tends to linger in rural people's minds is this, why should I pay a large part of my paycheck that I worked so hard to get to help someone else who isn't working? Tough for us to understand. Whatever your opinions about how much money governments spend and how they raise that money, there is a point at which the government cripples company and individual profits to such a degree that conducting business and working to earn a living becomes difficult or become difficult and even prohibitive. So as I mentioned before, every dollar that the government takes away is a dollar that is not spent on other things. One way this can torpedo an economy is this made up example of a grass seed farmer here in the valley. Let's say his name is Jerry Koblenz, not a real person. He owns 350 acres of grass seed fields. He leases an additional 650 acres, so he farms a total of 1,000 acres. He owns a small fleet of combines, tractors, and other machines. He also operates a warehouse where he cleans and bags his own grass seed, as well as the grass seed of surrounding neighbor farmers. Now, let's say the federal and state governments both decide to start raising taxes on businesses that gross over $1 million a year year. Jerry's farm does that, so he has an increased tax bill. Now, as the years go on, his farm's taxes keep being increased by both the Fed and state governments. Eventually, Jerry cuts his warehouse staff from three full-time employees to just one full-time employee, and he adds a couple of part-timers that he brings in whenever it's necessary. Jerry starts doing more of the warehouse work himself. As the taxes keep increasing year by year, Jerry quits updating his equipment, can't afford it. His tractors and combines start showing their wear and tear. He spends much more time in the shop during harvest than he used to. Within a few seasons, Jerry decides he has to cut down on the number of acres he can farm, so he gives up several hundred of his leased acres. By this time, Jerry only hires, a, uh, hires one or two field hands to help him in the summertime during the harvest. He quits operating the warehouse for anybody but himself. Even when cutting all of these costs, he barely makes a profit. And after paying his federal, state, uh, federal and state taxes, soon the repair costs, his crumbling warehouse, and the decreased productivity of his fields cause Jerry to sell his land, his equipment, and his farm buildings. After he sold everything off, he still can't pay off all his debts. He declares bankruptcy and loses his house as well. Poor Jerry. Jerry, his wife, and his two young kids are forced to move into government housing in Eugene, where Jerry also draws on unemployment. The high taxes have turned Jerry from a highly productive taxpayer to a highly needy tax money recipient. Now, this is a fictitious example, but it crudely illustrates how high taxes can squeeze the life right out of an economy. Two, inflation and debasement of money. One of the temptations to governments who are in charge of an economy is to solve financial problems by inflating the value of their currency. Right now, the U.S. government owes a huge amount of money, mostly in the form of government bonds. These bonds are held by all kinds of people, including foreign governments. What happens if the U.S. government can't pay its debts off? What will happen then? That will probably not happen. Why is that? Because the U.S. government will always be able to print more dollars to pay off its debts. The rest of the world will tolerate this, at least for a while, because the world economy runs on U.S. dollars. The result of this action will be inflation or would be inflation, which is which means more money chasing less stuff 
to buy. Another result of this is that nations will quit trusting the American dollar, they'll quit buying American bonds, and the U.S. Uh, uh, government will kind of come to a crashing halt. Um, so this, of course, would result in absolute chaos if it happens. Three, excessive public expenditures. This goes hand in hand with crushing taxes. The more money the government spends, the more it needs to raise. As I mentioned before, the U.S. government spends the majority of its money on the military and on social programs. Operating these social programs requires a complex bureaucracy to manage. Only about half of Americans pay any taxes today. The rest have a negative tax bill, which means that they end up receiving money from the federal government instead of, instead of um, paying money into it. At some point, that will not be sustainable. Four, excessive regulation and direction of the economy. In the past few lessons, we've discussed how the U.S. experiment has been to allow uh, citizens to be as free as possible while also maintaining stability. Excessive regulation means that government has slipped over the threshold of keeping the citizens safe and, uh, and is now unnecessarily clamping down on positive economic activity. I'll give you one real life example. I have a friend who runs a seamless gutter business. OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has officers that patrol workplaces to ensure that businesses are adequately training their employees to be safe and providing adequate safety equipment to keep the employees safe. I've heard horror stories about terrible working conditions in other countries where people are maimed or die because their employers simply don't care uh, about keeping their employees safe. However, my friend, uh, so it makes sense that there's, you know, some, uh, some, some, sort, some sort of agency in place to keep people safe. However, my friend, the gutter man, has complained about a specific regulation that makes work really hard for him. They are supposed to always wear a safety harness when climbing ladders. That means that every time they get on or off the ladder, they need to either hitch or unhitch their harnesses to the ladder. Whenever he has forced his crew to do this, they get extremely frustrated because they spend most of the day getting on and off the ladders. Now, question, is it a good idea to have workers wear safety harnesses? Well, it, it might be. Um, does it slow down production? Yes, it definitely does. Should the federal government force businesses to force their employees to do this? What do you think? My, my point in this little example is, is this, is that, is this a good idea? Is it not a good idea? I, I, I tend to feel like this is probably an example of, of overreach, overregulation. It leads to workers working slower, which leads to higher prices. And so this is probably one tiny example of government overreach. A better made up example is number two in your consider section that asks about the hospital in regards to overregulation. The point here is that overregulation can frustrate workers and businesses and eventually make conducting business so hard that businesses or individuals simply give up. Five, political plundering of the economy. This particular problem does not take place as much in the U.S. as it does in some other places around the world. While there certainly are corrupt politicians in the United States, the U.S. has never seen whole-scale plundering of the country's resources, such as that of some sub-Saharan African countries. Let me tell you about that. European countries seized nearly the entire continent of Africa between the years 1875 and 1900. These countries typically set up systems that funneled nearly all the African countries' countries wealth straight back to Europe. These European, very unfair, these European countries mostly gave Afri the African countries power back to them by 1960. In the wake of this uh, giving of power back, um, many sub-Saharan African countries have been racked by years and years of instability as one military dictator after the next has seized power and seized anything of value as well, similar to what the uh, Europeans were doing. Perhaps the best example of this is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It has an incredible set of natural resources, incredibly rich, lots of things, gold, silver, all kinds of natural resources. Yet, its citizens continue to be trapped in poverty because its economy is controlled by greedy overlords. In summary, while a government is necessary to provide economic stability, a government can also ruin a nation's economy. Several of the ways a government can do this is through excessive taxation, purposeful inflation of its currency, or debasement of its currency to pay off debts or pay its bills. Three, excessive spending. Four, excessive regulation. And five, plundering of its own economy. 
Let's hope and pray the U.S. economy and the Oregon economy do not fall to any of these terrible problems. Today, your assignment is to do 10.4. Um, also, heads up. There is a quiz. There is not a quiz. Thought there was a quiz on Friday. Never mind. Everyone have a good one. Mr. Chris out.